On the virtual Bible study tonight, we want to talk about heaven and hell. It's the, heaven and hell are topics that are always of great interest. We want to know more about what's beyond the grave. And so there are always some questions about heaven and hell. We're just going to try to field a few of those tonight and see what the Bible says. Okay, it's going to be an interesting discussion, and we're going to get started right now. It's time for this week's edition of the Virtual Bible Study. The Virtual Bible Study is a live, internet-only call-in program dedicated to the honest study and discussion of God's Word. Do you have a question about something in the Bible? Or are you simply interested in learning more about the Scriptures? If so, we hope you'll stay tuned tonight as we look into the pages of God's Word. The Virtual Bible Study is brought to you this time each week by the College View Church of Christ in Columbia, Tennessee. You can participate in the discussion tonight by calling 93 one three eight one four five six seven or by emailing your questions or comments from collegeview.com we hope you'll take out your bibles and study along with us as we begin an exciting study of god's word on this edition of the virtual bible study and we welcome you into the virtual bible study for thursday january 10th 2019 welcome to the program tonight we're glad that you're here my name is jacob gwynn my father greg Gwynn is here hello dad jacob great to be with you kyle's tonight. with us again tonight kyle welcome to the program it's good to be here glad to have you here glad that you're listening on the other end of the line tonight the best way for your voice to be heard as this is a listener participation program is over the phone tonight at 877-381-4567. Questions at collegeview.com is the email address to use. And the chat window below your video feed is maybe the most rapid way to let your comments be known. But we want to hear from you on the phone tonight if you can give us a call. Uh, we're going to make one last uh, offer of our daily Bible reading calendars, Jacob. <laughs> if you've not started yet, it's... It's not too late. You're getting behind. This is day 13, so there's been there's been 10 days worth of Bible readings as of tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, and and so you're 10 days behind, but this program has a catch-up feature. It it's, gives five days of reading in a seven-day week. So, and if you just read every day, you can catch up relatively quickly uh, and so if you want to get started on that you can get started by looking at our website the the reading calendar is on collegeview.com send us an email and we'll get you a, a paper copy as well uh, so we'll make that offer one more time right, you yeah. will not be sorry to spend time this year reading the bible no you will not so if you're not started on that uh, find out on our website how to, where to get started and then send us an email with your snail mail address to get a hard copy of that so you keep that with your bible and uh, be ready to go from here on out and then also we want to uh, plug an upcoming event here at College View two weeks from Saturday, uh, two weeks from this Saturday, the 26th, and then also the following Sunday on the 27th. Kevin, Ca Kevin Clark from Birmingham, Alabama will be here to speak to us. Uh, it's going to be really an intense period of Bible study. We're going to have five lessons in less than 24 hours uh, at 4 o'clock and 7 o'clock on Saturday. Then at our regular times on Sunday morning, 9.30, 10.30, and at 2.30 then on Sunday afternoon. Uh, we're building these as lessons especially appropriate for young people, but also for their parents, their families, and really all concerned Christians. And so we want everybody to come uh, with a focus on special things that we think our young people need to hear. And if you're anywhere near Columbia, Tennessee, we'd encourage you to make the drive to come be a part of these lessons are going to be very valuable, very important. Yeah, and, and those of us who know Kevin know he's a, a really good speaker, uh, solid uh, biblical instruction. Uh, the lessons will be really good. And we're starting at what time on Saturday? Four o'clock. Four o'clock. So there'll be a session at four o'clock and then again at seven o'clock on Saturday, and the 26th. Gonna, and we're going to be uh, getting, we'll start at two on Sunday afternoon. 2.30. 2.30. Yeah. So you could be on, I'm just thinking if I'm f maybe five, six hours away from Columbia, I can sleep in on Saturday morning and still make it here by four o'clock. And then Sunday afternoon, I could Tear out of here and be home in time for bed Sunday night. Yeah. You know, it might be worth a drive. Yeah, exactly. All right. Okay. All right. On to the topic tonight. All right. So uh, earlier to uh, our, our uh, update list, we sent out these questions. Get on our list by sending us an email to questions at collegeview.com. Say, put me on the list. We'll do it. And you'll get an update like this one that told of our discussion tonight. Question one, will everyone go to heaven? Okay. What is universalism? Is it true? Okay. Number two, will hell be eternal, or will lost souls simply be annihilated? That's a popular idea. 
And how could a loving God send people to hell, number three? And number four, this is just sort of a general interest question, I think. It always, uh, I think there's, people always have something to say about this question. Will the saved recognize one another in heaven? Okay. I think that's a, a, a question that a lot of people have. We want to try to cover all those bases tonight in our, in our discussion. It should be a good discussion, and we we'll want your participation as we go along through the program. Kent and Chris have both sent us uh, emails from the state of Georgia tonight. Lots of representation from that state. And uh, sign in the chat room from whatever state you're in and share your comments with us tonight. Well, let's start out on this idea of universalism. Uh, I think that's a really easy definition. We said, what is universalism? Universalism is the idea that everyone will be saved. Universal salvation. Everybody is saved. No one will be lost. Uh, easy to define. Absolutely impossible to defend from the scriptures. Uh, I mean, it, they're just... It's universally false. It's universally false. But it's really a, a, a popular idea. In fact, I, I have a note here from one theologian at the United Theological Seminary, he said that universalism is, quote, one of the hottest burners on the Christian stove today. Whoa. So I didn't uh, realize that. Uh, among lots of religious folks, this is a very popular idea, and a lot of people are buying in. All right. Uh, according to Google, this is what Chris sends in, it is the belief that all humankind will be eventually saved. As stated above, and this is previous comments that we'll get to, he says, this is not true and nonsense. A few years ago, I actually listened to a few of a Universalist Church's sermon podcast to see what they were like. It was pretty much a bunch of hogwash and a complete waste of their members' time. Well, thank you, Chris, for those comments. You know, we interviewed a few years ago uh, a woman preacher from the Unitarian Universalist Church in Nashville. Mm -hmm. She was on the program with us, and uh, we talked with her. She's a nice lady, uh, but, I mean completely unhindered by anything that the Bible says. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to believe, you don't have to believe in God. You certainly don't have to believe in Jesus Christ. You don't even have to be a nice person. <laughs> uh, but really there's, there's no, there's no requirement because well, if you think about it, if everybody's going to be saved, doesn't matter what you do or believe or say. Uh, and so that, that, that's, uh, again, I think it's an easy to define topic, but it's just it's just completely without any support in scriptures. D. Uh, Roy or Droy in the chat room says there's also this idea which may be semi universal or semi universalism. But that is if you accept Jesus in your heart, you're good. Where is this in the Bible, D. Roy asks? Yeah. Uh, well, of course, that's not e that's not found in the Bible either. Uh, that's uh, then, as he says. That's a little more restricted, maybe semi-universal. If if I at least believe in God and Jesus, I'm okay. So, and I think I think he's right. I think that there are a lot of people who would would probably accept that. They wouldn't accept just blanket universalism, but basically, if you just accept the idea that there is a God and Jesus is His Son, you're okay. You're Christian with real yeah. loose yeah. quotation marks around it. You're okay. Yeah. But as to this general notion of universalism, the Bible just denies it emphatically. Psalm 9, verse 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. The word for hell there is Sheol, and that's uh, it's sometimes a generic word just meaning sort of the pit or death, but, they, but it is exclusively used of the meaning of the depository, or excuse me, the realm where wicked will receive punishment, and there are a number of references like that. Uh, Daniel in the Old Testament uh, spoke of the uh, those who will experience everlasting shame and contempt. Daniel chapter 2, 12 verse 2. Daniel, Daniel 12 verse 2. I'm thinking about Matthew chapter 7 verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. I see a lot of people there, but a lot of people are not going to be saved, that, according that, to that Jesus. That sure doesn't teach universalism. In fact, that teaches actually minority salvation. Yeah. Few will find That's the way it that leads to life. Yeah. Uh, probably a passage that gets called upon more often than any other in this discussion is Matthew chapter 25. Jesus is describing the judgment scene. He said in verse 31, Matthew 25, 31, 
Uh, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all his holy angels with him, then shall he set upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from his goats. I think a lot of our listeners know. How, I'm not going to read all that because it goes clear to the end of the chapter. But he says uh, at the end of that discussion, he says, um, these, speaking of wicked ones, or those who had not done his will, not lived the life that is expected of them, these shall go away into, this is Matthew 25, verse 46, these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto life eternal. I mean, we're going to talk a little bit more about whether hell it lasts forever or not in a minute, so we won't comment. We're going to use that verse again. But notice, there's, there's, there's clearly two options. Universalism says there's just one destiny of all the dead. Jesus clearly said that there's two distinct alternatives here. You don't need to have numbers of which one, go, you know, how many are in that uh, goat population that Jesus is talking about. If it's just one, universalism is not yeah, true. Yeah, that's exactly right. If, if, if one person doesn't go to heaven, then universalism, the, the whole idea is false. Okay. And, and of course, and, and as you read earlier there from Matthew 7, verse 13, 14, says really the majority will be lost and only a minority will be saved. All right. Um, so uh, what else could we have? Paul in Romans 2 uh, spoke about the judgment of God, the day of his wrath. What does that mean? If, if, if all will be saved, what, what could possibly be meant by God, the, the day of God's judgment, the day of his wrath? Yeah. Clearly that would suggest the idea of punishment. Uh, and then look at Second, Corinthians, Second Thessalonians. Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, uh, we'll back up to verse 7. You who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord from the glory of his power. Now, I don't know how I don't know how you read that and come to the conclusion everybody's going to be saved. It just doesn't fit. Uh, um, you, and you, in, in that context, you really need to start in verse six, seeing as a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. Yeah. So God is going to bring tribulation on those who are wicked, and rest to those who are righteous. When he returns with his flaming, uh, with his angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that don't know God. Exactly right. Okay. Uh, and and then there's passages. It seems like we end up referencing this one pretty often. First Corinthians six, nine through eleven. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Uh, I mean, I, I don't have to, I don't have to have any help de deciphering that statement. The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. There's a whole list of people who are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. So, uh, again, it's, it's pretty hard to imagine how anybody could, uh, reading the Bible, take the universalist view. All right. 877-381-4567, questions at collegeview.com is the email address to use uh, on the program tonight. Kent in jo Calhoun, Georgia says, no, all individuals will not go to heaven. He references Matthew 7, 21 through 23, Matthew 25, 31 through 46. Um, and Some of the same verses we were just reading, right? All right. Exactly right, And Kent. then um, uh, Chris in uh, Atlanta says... Uh, Absolutely not will everyone go to heaven. Matthew seven fourteen and 21. Luke 16, 22 through 23. I used to be an apprentice funeral director and embalmer and attended many, many funerals. The one thing that struck me is that almost every single, at every single funeral, it was said that the deceased was better off and in heaven. So yeah, maybe those funeral <laughs> preachers are a little bit universalist. Maybe. That is kind of interesting because you do hear that. I mean, have you ever been to a funeral? Where the preacher said, this guy surely will be lost forever in hell. <laughs> I mean, nobody says, I mean, and I, I have been called upon to preach funerals. Of course, none of us are the eternal judge. 
So it's, we're, it's not really possible for any of us to say whether anybody's going to heaven or hell. We, and we shouldn't even go there. I remember the first time I was ever called upon to preach a funeral, and I was pretty nervous about it. And, a, and, a, and an older preacher told me, listen, he says, it's not your job to preach this person into heaven or hell. Uh, that's, that's totally in the hands of God now that this person has died, and you don't even have to go there. Uh, and so uh, I, I really I thought that was good advice, and I've always tried to adhere to that in preaching funerals. But, but I have preached the funerals of people. I have both preached the funerals of people I thought probably were going to be in heaven, and I've preached the funerals of some people that I was almost certain you wouldn't want to be would, in their shoes. Would, nonetheless. At least I wouldn't want to be in their shoes. Yeah. But I wouldn't say so. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But it, you know. Uh, but as as was observed in that comment, almost at, at almost every funeral, people say, "Yeah, this guy he's in a better place. Uh, yeah. well, he may not be. At least he's not <laughs> suffering anymore." Yeah, maybe he is though. Yeah. yeah. So um, let's take a break, and when we get back, uh, we need to get into the question about hell. You know, some people believe, lots of people believe that. Well, you, you, the bad people they're not going to be in heaven, but meh, yeah. they're just going to so, sort of. So poof, I think we gone. can. I think we can say. Really, beyond any shadow of doubt, not everybody's going to heaven. But what about those people who miss it? Are they going to be in an eternal burning hell or not? Or right. will they just be kind of wiped out? All right. We're going to get a break and get your thoughts during the break. Yeah, don't go anywhere. The Virtual Bible Study continues right after this. Now you can listen to a podcast of a recent sermon every week. Find out more at collegeview.com. There's more of the Virtual Bible Study right after these important messages. What does your church have for my children? At the College View Church of Christ, we don't have pizza parties or putt-putt nights. We don't have softball or basketball. We do have the Bible. We do have the powerful sayings of the gospel of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We do have the love for your children's souls to never substitute the solid spiritual teaching they need with superficial secular activities. If this is what you want for your children, bring them to Bible class this Sunday at 9.30 a.m. at the College View Church of Christ. Here's some quotes worth pondering. Undertake something that is difficult. It will do you good. Unless you try to do something beyond what you have already mastered, you will never grow. It takes both hands to lay hold on eternal life. You'll have to let go of everything else. Thomas Edison said, If we all did the things we're capable of doing, we would literally astound ourselves. Do a little more each day than you think you possibly can. Man, wish I'd said that. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. The virtual Bible study continues. We're back on the program tonight as we talk about heaven and hell and what the scriptures say about it. What about, uh, what about hell? Is it so our, question, real? Second, our second question sent out on our update list is, Will hell be eternal, or will lost souls simply be annihilated? Uh, this this is a question that gets quite a bit of press. Have we ever quoted Albert Einstein on the virtual Bible study? No, I don't think we have. Yeah. Here's a quote from here's a quote from. Some folks might have thought we were when you were expressing your thoughts. I don't know. But, yeah. uh, no, no way. Here's what uh, Albert Einstein said. He, he, actually, he believed that there was some sort of. Uh, supreme being some sort of a god and he said he, he believed that this being revealed himself in quote the the orderly harmony of the universe well, i would I happen mean, to agree with him on I, that I, I think that's true i think god has revealed himself in you but he went on it but he went on to say however i cannot imagine a, he, he did not believe in the god of the bible mm -hmm. because he said i cannot imagine a god who rewards and punishes the objects of his creation okay so he, he refused, especially, I, well, he said, I can't imagine rewarding or, or punishing. But uh, obviously that punishment thing was a, a, an objection. A lot of our listeners will have heard of Bertrand Russell. He was a famous agnostic in Britain. And he said one of the reasons why he could not be a Christian was because Jesus Christ believed in hell, which is a good observation. It's interesting to note when you study your New Testament, the person who spoke about hell more than any other, Jesus himself. So Russell was right about that. Uh, he said, quote, no person who is really profoundly humane can believe in an everlasting punishment. So he, uh, he's better than that. He's too, yeah. he's yeah, too, yeah, good. He's he's too good to believe well, in that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but 
maybe more to the point, right in our own religious community, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe in an eternal burning hell. Uh, they allege that the concept of everlasting punishment is, quote, an unreasonable doctrine that, quote, contradicts the Bible. Well, wow. I believe. Not... So get that. Everlasting punishment, unreasonable and contradicts the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, the Seventh-day Adventists argue that the idea of eternal hell is not biblical, and they believe that the wicked will simply be annihilated, although kind of interesting, after an appropriate period of punishment. <laughs> well. Now, I don't know how, I, I suppose they're going to leave that up to God, what God thinks is appropriate. So the wicked will be punished for some appropriate period, period. of time, and then uh, they will be wiped out annihilated. Mm -hmm. um, so, again, you get the idea. This is a, a pretty common position. Among churches of Christ, it's gaining some traction. Really? Yeah. Back in 1982, some of our listeners will know the name Edward Fudge. Uh, he preached. He was an author. Uh, he wrote a book, and it was published back in 82. So what, what did that make it? That's uh, 20, 30, 5, 37 years ago. Uh, he wrote a book called The Fire That Consumes. Mm -hmm. Well, you can almost get, from, you almost get from the idea that it's talking about that the wicked will be consumed or, or, or wiped out. Uh, he asserted that unrighteous people will be raised in judgment, punished for a while, and then banished to total everlasting extinction. Uh, so that sounds sort of like what the Seventh-day Adventists believe, punished for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, John Clayton, I don't know how many of our listeners will know the name John Clayton. John Clayton is a... Is a um, an apologist, uh, he, he, he puts out a, a magazine that I've received for years. I, I suppose I've been getting his magazine for almost 40 years called Does God Exist? And so he makes a lot of arguments uh, for the existence of God. However, he's a theistic evolutionist. Uh, but at the 1991 uh, Pepperdine University lectures, Pepperdine University, very liberal institution, but with connections to churches of Christ, Clayton said, quote, I have never been able to be comfortable with the position that a person who rejected God should suffer forever and ever and ever. And then at the 1988 Pepperdine University lectures, F. Lagarde Smith said, God will, quote, destroy the soul, not punish it, not dangle it, not torture it. He will destroy it. And so F. Lagarde Smith believes in annihilation. But those are some folks associated with Churches of Christ who are taking that view. Yeah. So what about that? Uh, is, is, is the idea of an eternal hell, is it true or not? Uh, and, uh, a lot of people denying it. Yeah, I, I hate to wreck their, the ego of these gentlemen, but uh, I don't think that God necessarily cares what they think is appropriate or uh, reasonable or humane. Yeah, it, you know, it, it, it really, if you, it, it's, it, it's completely illogical for us, his creation, to say that he's not good. Yeah, we put the parameters on what he can do. Yeah, and what we, he, can. We, he made us, but we're going we're gonna to tell him whether he can do what he yeah. says he's going to do or not, whether we think he's right in right. doing that sort of thing. Because the scriptures very plainly talk about an everlasting hell. Let's go back to the passage we read earlier from Matthew 25, verse 46. Remember, that's, that Matthew 25 passage is sort of Jesus depicting the judgment scene. And he says, these, the wicked, shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Now, what's really interesting about that statement it uses the word everlasting punishment. It uses the word life eternal, but they are the same word. And so whatever one means, the other also means. Yeah. So do you believe in heaven? Almost everybody believes in heaven. How long is heaven going to last? Heaven's going to last forever and ever and ever. No, an appropriate time. No, it's going to last forever and ever and ever. Everybody believes that. But the punishment, the same word... Uh, modifies the word. punishment in the same context in the same verse in the same sentence 
so however long heaven is, you, you tell us how long you think heaven is. However long that is, that's how long hell is. And that's what Chris sent in his email. He said, hell is eternal. Matthew 25, 46, the verse you referenced, uses the same word to describe punishment in life. Eternal. If hell is temporary, then so is our time in heaven. Exactly. I don't know anyone who would believe that, Chris says. Exactly right, Chris. Thank you, Chris. And then Kent says, hell will be an eternal, according to Matthew 25, 46, where there is no consciousness, there can be no punishment. Those in hell will suffer, suffer eternal conscious torment. I agree. Thank you, Kent. I think you're right. Again, on we that. got no, and we got no vested interest in that doctrine and believing well, that. Well, I, I, I would just as soon have the idea that hell would be an annihilation. Uh, I, I do think, though, it's sort of an invitation to low living. If you if you take that view, Kyle, you understand what I'm saying. Oh, of I, course. Uh, well, yeah, I'm not going to go to heaven, but it's not going to be bad. I'm, I'm just I'm just going to enjoy what I got here while I can do it, and then I'll just get wiped out. What's the big deal, right, Kyle? I'd be extremely. Odd. That would be an invitation to a very bad, to very base living, though, because it's, I don't see any, there's no incentive to live good at all. So if, if there's no hell. That's it? I think you're right. I think you're right. Uh, Revelation chapter 14, verse 10. Uh, it says, those, the unrighteous, shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image, whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So notice, uh, the, the, they're going to experience the wrath of God tormented forever and ever it says how about mark 9 verse 43 if thy hand offend thee cut it off it is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched and if thy foot offend thee cut it off it is better for thee to enter enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that shall never be quenched where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Yeah. It seems uh, pretty clear, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, again, why would you not take those statements at their, at their literal meaning? What, what? The only reason that you wouldn't is because of some emotional sense that you have is that that, that wouldn't be fair or just or right. Uh, and we're going to talk about that after our next break. But we're going to talk, how, how, how could a loving God do that to people? Well, I think there's an answer to that question. But uh, without even trying to answer that question, just deal with the statements. They're very plain and straightforward. All right. Con about consciousness after death. Now, this isn't hell. This is Hades, a precursor uh, to the punishment of hell, though. In Luke chapter 16, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. The Lazarus in Hades lift up his eyes and being in torments and see Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented. In this flame, Lazarus was still conscious and still yeah. in existence after death, even mm -hmm. though, I mean, the rich man was, even though he was wicked and being punished. Yeah, so it's conscious punishment, a, pun a, a punishment that you, in which you are conscious of the punishment. But by the way, I, that may be the reason why they, some of these annihilationists have to say, well, you'll be punished for a while and then annihilated, because you can't get around the fact and we're going to talk more about the rich man and Lazarus in our last segment when we talk about, well, we know each other after the grave. Maybe the reason they, they say, well, we're going to be punished for a while is because you can't get around that. Unless you're like the Jehovah's Witnesses and just say it's a parable. And if it's a parable, what in the world does it teach? Yeah. If it's not based in fact that uh, there's punishment after death. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, we got a, a in the chat room. Yeah, Kevin's got a comment. Ke Kevin's got a, a very appropriate uh, chat room uh, comment in the chat room. Hollywood imagines a hell where Satan is the caretaker and the condemned are simply inconvenienced. We need to teach the fact that Satan will be punished, thrown down by God, and all other disobedient souls will be in a tormenting for all eternity. 
They will wish for annihilation, but it is not spoken of in Scripture. And that, and that is an idea. You see the, uh, Satan with his pitchfork, and he's sort of the one stoking the fire, and he's really giving it to all the bad people. Yeah. Now, he's going to be getting it just like the rest of them. Yeah, exactly right. All right. Uh, in the YouTube chat window, Richard comments. He says, we read a lot about the degrees of punishment in the Bible, and we read a little a hint of different rewards. Can you speak on these different rewards no matter what? Heaven will be worth it. Uh, so the question is, will there be, it's, it's, it's a twofold question. I think it's an excellent question. I wasn't really prepared to speak to it tonight, and, and maybe we need to deal with this on, an, on a subsequent study. Maybe we can throw this in our question pile. Uh, I actually don't think that, they, that the Bible suggests degrees of reward or punishment. Uh, I think that when you read those passages that talk about degrees, I think it's actually talking about the degree of judgment, the harshness of judgment. Punishment, I mean, a judgment is going to be much harsher for those of us who had so many opportunities to serve and didn't use them. Uh, so many good opportunities to do right and we didn't do right. I think the scriptures do teach the idea of degrees of judgment, but I've never been able to be real comfortable with the ideas of degrees of punishment and reward. But let, let's let's hold off on that. And it, But if somebody wants to comment more on that, you're welcome to do so in the chat room. Uh, but we will make a note to Put try and do a, that in a future uh, yeah. discussion. All right. Time for a break. When we get back, well... You know, this does sound really harsh, and some folks would say, that doesn't seem to line up with my idea of God. How could a loving God send people to hell? We need to answer that question when we get back from the break. And there is an answer from the Scripture to that question, and so we'll take that on the other side. Don't go anywhere. The Virtual Bible Study will continue right after this week's bullet point. Have you checked out all of the resources on collegeview.com lately? Check it out now while you listen to these important messages. The Virtual Bible Study will be right back after this. This is Greg Gwynn with this week's bullet point. From time to time, you might hear someone described as high maintenance. It could be a man referring to his girlfriend or a husband discussing his wife or vice versa. The phrase might be used in regards to any person who shares a relationship with others. The meaning of this expression is this. This individual requires constant attention. They expect and demand that others will attend to their every whim and expectation. Typically, these people will not do anything for others because it seems it never crosses their mind to think about what someone else might want or need. Their total emphasis is on me, me, me. Unfortunately, there are some members of the church who are high maintenance. These are the folks who are always complaining about things that they feel should have been done for them. I was sick and no one came to see me. I was overlooked when someone was selected for this office or another. I've never been invited to so-and-so's house for a meal. I wasn't included when some others made plans to do this or that, and so on and so on and so on. A little investigation will show that this high-maintenance individual has never done any of these things for anyone else. Usually these folks are not particularly friendly, almost never show hospitality, don't visit the sick, never see about the needs of others, and generally ignore any situation that doesn't involve their own interest or desires. They are self-centered and full of self-pity. Such folks need to learn to look outside their own circle, to realize that self is not the most important thing. Paul said it this way, quote, In lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Philippians 2, verses 3 through 5. That's this week's bullet point. Think about it. My name is Cole, and I'm eight years old. My name is Thomas, and I'm seven years old. And our families love to listen to the virtual Bible study. Broadcasting around the world with truths that are out of this world. The Virtual Bible Study. Take it away, guys. We're back on the program tonight. Remind you, this program is brought to you by the College of Church of Christ in Columbia, Tennessee. Find out more about us at our website, thevirtualbiblestudy.com. You've got the announcement for our upcoming weekend series on, on the website. Collegeview.com. On our homepage. Again, if you're anywhere within driving distance of Columbia, Tennessee, it's going to be worth your drive. You'll want to come down to that. Find out more about our uh, website or our event at uh, our website, thevirtualbiblestudy.com or collegeview.com. If you've got any questions, send us an email to questions at collegeview.com. And also use the, the uh, study uh, aid of the archives that are found on the Virtual Bible Study page. All of the audio archives dating back 13 years. I mean, that ad that you just played, Jacob, Good. reminded me. Cole on that ad said, I'm eight years old. He's now 18 years old. 
uh, so that that ad was recorded uh, more than 10 years ago, yeah. and uh, we've been out there that long, 13 years worth of programs on lots of, I mean, just a, an incredible array of subjects, and so you can do a search on that page. Look especially to the WMA Archives, Windows Media uh, Audio, uh, WMA Archives on our Virtual Bible Study page, and it and you can do a search on that page, and you can find, I mean, if you're studying a subject and have a question and want to hear something said about it, you very well might find something there. And so some people listen while they work. And if you want to start listening now, you listen, if you work 40 hours a week, you can start listening to our programs, and uh, you'll get through all of them by this time around end of May. Yeah, if you listen to every day, five days a week or seven days a week. Five days a week while, uh, you're, while you're at work. Okay. It'd be April or May, somewhere around there, when yeah. you're going to get through with that. So. Yeah. Well, we can keep you, uh, uh, well, listening for a while. So l check out those archives. Okay. Uh, and some of our listeners have listened to them all, by the way. Yes, that's right. That's right. In, in the chat room, Anthony mentions, he said, I don't believe the scriptures speak of different rewards of eternal life. But he says, when we read scriptures such as Second Peter 2.20, that those who left the faith will get it worse than before obeying uh he thinks that teaches degrees of punishment. I actually don't, Anthony. I, I, I think that just saying they're in worse shape because they've rejected the they gospel. They threw their lifeline and, away. And they, yeah, they, they threw their lifeline away, I think, is a good way to sort of state that. But we, we'll talk more about it. I think that's, that's obviously a topic we can talk more about. It's real, real interesting. He also mentions many stripes, few stripes. Uh, uh, another way, hell is some, somewhere where everyone should avoid. Uh, no matter. And I agree. I mean, what? lots or little hell's going to be awful lots or little heaven's going to be wonderful and and so you know uh but that's a real interesting question we'll try to deal with it more okay all right now the question at hand how could a loving god send people to hell um well uh first of all how are we going to get our answer to that question it's well it goes back because, because the the fact of the matter is we we can't speak of this. We can't answer it on the basis of of our human experience, and so we, we're pretty much going to have to decide whether God, and He is a loving God. There's no doubt about the love of God. We got to decide whether He would send people to hell based upon what He said. We, we can't do it from personal experience. We can't do it from our personal emotion or think so. What does the Bible say on that subject? Will a loving God send people to hell or not? Uh, now I think I think a really important starting place on that is to say there's no question that God is a loving God. You know, it, it, it's not it, it's not if he's a loving God, he can't send to hell. Those two things can't go. He's a loving God whether he sends people to hell or not. He's a loving God. Uh the absolute extreme evidence of his love is in that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross to, so that men didn't have to go to hell. Uh, but but I just want to get that out there. It's Whatever we decide about people going to hell, God is a loving God. I mean, uh, 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 that's without question. It's not debatable. God is a loving God. Absolutely. Um, but I, I like what you said there about how we can't uh, we can't um well, we get into realms here where our minds can't comprehend that. We don't need to limit God by our minds and our understanding of him. You know, Job got into a lot of trouble with that, trying to figure out why God did this, why God allowed yeah, that. Yeah, questioning God. And I like what he says in, in chapter 26 of uh, Job, verse 14. Lo, these are parts of his ways, but how little a portion of him is heard. But the thunder of his power, who can understand? The New King James Version uh, puts it like this. Indeed, these are the mere edges of his ways. The things that we can see of God and understand of God, just the hem of the garment. Now, we don't understand the infinite God. We know only, all we know about him is what he told us about himself mm -hmm. in the Bible. Yeah, how small a whisper we hear of him, but the thunder of his power, who can understand? Yeah. We can't understand all about God, and yeah. we need to quit trying. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but here's some things we do know because yep, he revealed them. Because these. he revealed them, yeah. One is that he is an absolutely holy being. In Revelation chapter 4, uh, sort of the picture in heaven around the throne of God, 
uh, and the, and th those beings around the throne uh, are constantly saying day and night, they rest not day and night, saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which is and which was and which is to come. Uh, God is, is, is he, he is a loving God. He's an ultimately holy God. In his holiness, obviously, he can't do wrong. It's, uh, it's, it's God, God can't sin. It's impossible for God to do wrong. James chapter 1, verse 13, let no man say when he is tempted of God, I am, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. God is not tempted with evil. He's ultimately holy, ultimately uh, uh, loving. He's also ultimately just. Because he's a just God, uh, he can't he can't ignore sin, violations of law. Uh, Habakkuk, in chapter one, verse thirteen: Your eyes are too pure to look upon evil favorably. You cannot tolerate wrong. So that's his just. So we got to take we got to take the full picture. Of God, he's loving, he's holy. He's just, so you got you got to put all that together, uh, and then talk about the sinfulness of man. When we sin, sin separates us from God. Uh, Isaiah fifty nine two: Your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Your sins have hid His face from you. Yeah. So, uh, why why does sin separate us from God? Because He's ultimately holy and just. Uh, he he can't tolerate. He can't look favorably upon sin, and so when we sin, it it brings this separation between us because of his nature, and we've violated his law. Uh, now, what hell constitutes is a final and complete and ultimate separation. So our sins separate us from God, but while we still live and have breath in our physical bodies. We have the opportunity to resolve that alienation through the redeeming work of Jesus Christ. Uh, now, again, talk, that, talk about God's love. God's love, while he is ultimately holy and just, while he can't tolerate evil, he made it possible for us to resolve the alienation that exists because of our sins, and he, and he paid that price with the blood of his own son. Uh, and, and so... Uh, I think that I think that all speaks to the total picture of God and and His relationship with man. Uh, in Second Thessalonians one nine, a, a verse we read earlier, those who know not God and who obey not the gospel shall suffer punishment, even eternal destruction, from the face of the Lord, from the glory of His might. That's just pretty plain. Uh, but we're going to be separated from God because God can't tolerate evil. He's a just God. And evil must be punished. Romans 11, verse 22, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which uh, fell, severity, but toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. And so God is just as loving as God is. He's also that uh, much uh, just yeah. and demands uh, uh, punishment for sin. I think it's important for us to, to recognize that that. We're, we're imposing our definition of a loving God on God himself. You know, oh, yeah. God defines himself. And defines love. And defines love. And, and so, you know, for us to say, if God sends people to hell, he's not a loving God. Well, that's by our definition, not his. He is a loving God. And he is to define what is loving. And, and so, you know, it's, it's, it, it's just it's, it's a matter of us imposing human wisdom versus the revelation of Scripture. All right. Um, uh, Kevin says, I like thinking about studying. I like thinking and studying about heaven and hell when I'm striving to do his will. If I'm not doing his will, I will probably look for reasons to think that hell or punishment does not exist. This is likely where these out of context ideas about heaven and hell originate. I like that idea that, that, that uh, maybe when we don't want to submit to God, or we don't want to accept the reality. We may look for things that make us feel better. Yeah. Uh, on YouTube chat, Anthony says, uh, if God wasn't loving, he wouldn't be just. He is no respecter of persons. Mm. I am just with my two children. If they disobey, they receive the punishment. If just one disobeys, that one receives the punishment. He mentions Proverbs thirteen twenty four. I think that's a good, I think that's a, uh, a good 
analogy, really. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's flawed only to the extent that we as fathers are flawed. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when, when a, a father punishes his children, is he, does that mean he has no love for his children? No, he loves his children. Love demands that, that wrong be punished. Love demands justice. Pal thought? Yeah. I think the very nature of God, he discussed this. It's, you know, God loves us. He wants us to be obedient to him. If we love God, we'll be obedient to him. I mean, and because God is light, God is, there's no darkness in God. If those who die in darkness must be separated from him. So it's, well, it's, true. It's, okay. Uh, this is an interesting point by Chris in Georgia. God does not send people to hell. We all have a choice. If our choice is to disobey God, then his nature of being a just God demands we be punished. If God were not just, then we could not trust him at all. Interesting points by Chris. God doesn't send people to hell. We set our own they destiny. make our own choice to be yeah. there. And then Kent says, God is indeed loving. The case being that God is loving necessitates that God gives all accountable individuals the freedom of choice. While God, through his Son, will be the final judge, it is also the case that the final judgment will be based upon the choices we have made in life on earth. Therefore, God ultimately does not send any individual to hell. God will honor the personal choices that individuals make. Those in hell will be there because of their own personal choice. They chose to be there. Yeah, they're yeah. both in Georgia. I wonder if they got together before they sent in those emails. Because pretty good. Pretty, pretty similar. Pretty good. All right. And then in the chat room, Kevin says, I... I like thinking and studying about heaven and hell when I'm striving to do his will. Well, we I'm, got that one already. Oh, you already did that I did that I'm, one. I'm sorry. I've got that I'm sorry. I'm, sorry. Yep. I'm reading something else while you were reading okay. that, I guess. All right. Okay. Let's, let's get a break, and then when we get back, we'll go to the top of the hour with your comments. And the last question is, well, it's one that many people wonder about. Will the saved recognize one another in heaven? All right. Yeah. What do you think about that? Send in your comments in the chat room and send in your other questions, and don't go anywhere. We're going to the top of the hour right after this. These guys are Did doing she, she all the of the talking. <laughs> we need to hear from you. Call in now. The virtual Bible study continues right after this. These guys are doing all of the talking. We need to hear from you. Call in now. The virtual Bible study continues right after this. When you take away the ice cream socials, the family center, the gym, the fellowship hall, and the plays from your church, what do you have left? Is there anything of real spiritual substance? Is there anything that says this is all about God and not all about me? At the College View Church of Christ, we want to stay focused on the goal of serving God. We don't offer what most churches offer. But we do offer Jesus Christ and Him crucified. If that's what you're looking for, come worship with us this Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. at the College View Church of Christ. We're tracking the trends on the virtual Bible study. A majority of Americans, 57%, say that knowing what is right or wrong is a matter of personal experience. Even 41% of practicing Christians agree that the only truth one can know is whatever is right for one's own life. About two-thirds of all American adults, 65%, agree that, quote, every culture must determine what is acceptable morality for its people, unquote. That information is via the Barna Group. The Word of God says in Proverbs 14, verse 12, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Colossians 3, 17. Now, back to the program. We're back on the program tonight, going to the top of the hour, talking about heaven and hell. I'm making your comments in the chat room. I have a little time to squeeze in uh, another question, if you've got one. The last uh, question. And, and don't, by the way, don't let us forget to make that note. i got to make that note. We want to talk in the future, and we'll try to do that, about degrees of punishment and reward, and, and that, that's a good study in itself. D. Roy but, in the chat room says, I've always wondered if we recognize biblical characters too, that is, uh, for example, Peter, John, and Jesus. I think it's, it's a really interesting question, and a lot of people wonder about it. And, and i got to tell you, I, I know folks that I respect who take both sides of this question, and it's actually not... I, I don't think this would be one of those kind of things where it would be critical for us to be in agreement about it. Uh, you know, I, th I think some people, some, some well-studied people conclude they don't think we will know one another in heaven. But I, in, in, in my c conclusion, I think it's pretty straightforward that we will. 
And so let's talk about that. Um, from the Old Testament, a couple of good examples. One is Abraham. In Genesis 25, verse 8, it says, Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and he was gathered to his people. Now, okay. what does gathered to his people mean? It doesn't mean that he was buried where his people were buried because uh, he was buried near Mamre in Canaan, but his ancestors would have been buried hundreds of miles away in, in, in the Ur of the Chaldees, a distant land at that time. And so gathered to his people, what does it mean? Well, gathered to his people, I think, gathered to his people, going to his fathers, gathered to his fathers, all those are kind of expressions in the Old Testament. And they seem to denote a reunion with faithful loved ones who have departed. Mm -hmm. So there's a hint. It may not be conclusive, but it's a hint. Here's another, Jacob. Remember, Jacob was deceived into believing that his son Joseph was dead. And he said, uh, I will go down to Sheol to my son. Morning. I, no, I will go down to Sheol or the pit. I will go down to my son mourning. So he was anticipating joining Joseph and not in a common grave somewhere. Uh, in fact, he, he didn't even think Joseph had a grave. He, 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 at that, when he said that, he thought Joseph had been consumed by wild beasts. But he expected to uh, be reunited with him. Famously, David said in 2 Samuel 12, verse 23, when the son born to Bathsheba died, he said, can I bring him back again? Question mark. I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Notice, I shall go to him. Yeah. All of those statements, I think, convey the, the, at least the, the uh, idea or the suggestion of a reunion with those who've died and gone on before. Um, what else we know? Jesus said, Matthew 8, verse 11, get this, Matthew 8, verse 11, many will come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. I'll we'll, we'll get that. If so, it would be that would be sort of a meaningless promise of heaven if Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would be unrecognizable. I mean, so basically, I'd be sitting down with a nameless mass of people if I don't recognize anyone. Jesus didn't say the, the, he didn't say that the righteous will sit down with a unidentifiable mass of people. In eternity, he said, "We'll sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob." I think that clearly suggests that those those individuals will certainly be recognizable. And then, of course, that would also be confirmed by the events on the Mount of Transfiguration. That's true. When Jesus was transfigured, Moses and Elijah appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration with him. Moses and Elijah had been dead for hundreds of years. Uh, but they were they still had identity and were recognizable in that identity, which suggests that our personal identity is preserved after death. I think the, the amount of transfiguration uh, is, is a pretty clear case uh, that I, that our personal identity endures. In Revelation chapter four, John is uh, taken to heaven or in the spirit. In verse 2, in the, immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he that sat, on, uh, sat was to look upon like uh, jasper and sardine stone, and there was a rainbow around the throne in, in sight like unto an emerald. Notice verse 4 of Revelation 4. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders setting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. So they're identifiable here as elders, and, and their their appearance is identifiable. So it, I mean, John was able to say, well, those are elders sitting on the throne. So how, okay. I mean, so, not maybe not unique identity, but at least some identity I there. think so. Okay. Of course, the, the one that just stands out in, in this discussion is the one you mentioned earlier about the rich man and Lazarus. Um, the rich man... Not only does it teach conscious punishment after death for the wicked, the rich man was conscious of the punishment he was suffering. I am in torment in these flames, he said. But he 
recognized Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. He recognized Abraham. Abraham talked to him. He recognized Abraham and Lazarus. Abraham and Lazarus both were knowable beyond the grave. As you said, the Jehovah's Witnesses try to dismiss that by saying it's just a parable. But, and I don't think it is. Uh, if it is, it is different than any other parable Jesus taught. But even if it's a parable, is Jesus conveying something that's patently false? Yeah. Uh, by way, of, I don't think so. Uh, so uh, I think the rich man and Lazarus may be one of the proof positive texts about the idea that we will I identify or know one another in heaven. Now, here's the big, big hang-up question. How could I be happy in heaven if I looked around and I searched all of those who were there and I realized that one or more of my loved ones wasn't there? For instance, I go to heaven and, and I'm searching for my wife and my wife is not there. Oh, my wife didn't make it. How could I possibly be he happy in heaven knowing that my wife didn't make it? That's a big bugaboo to a lot of people. <clears throat> I think the answer to it is, notice in Revelation chapter 7, verse 17, chapter 21, verse 4, God shall wipe away every tear. There's not, there's not going to be any sorrow in heaven. But, but I think the reason why I would be able to accept that reality, if it were so, Probably far more likely to be the other way. She'd be searching for me, and I wouldn't be Ooh. there. Uh, but either way, I think in, in heaven, uh, we're going to have a, a complete understanding of the ways of God. Uh, uh, you know, and, and, if, and if a loved one is not there, we're going to understand perfectly the justice of God and why they're not there. Uh, we're not going to be bound by the, the limitations of human emotion in heaven. We're going to have perfect, complete knowledge and understanding. Uh, uh, and so I, I think this argument against personal recognition in eternity is an emotional one that, that I don't think will carry any weight when we're actually in heaven. Uh, you know, it's very hard for us to envision what it would be like to be in the presence of God. You know, a lot of people say, when I get to heaven, I want to talk to Moses and see what it was like with all those plagues. And I want to talk to Paul and, and see what, what it was like. What did Paul, that, that time he got shipwrecked, what was that like? And Daniel and the lions, I want to talk to these. I don't think that necessarily we're going to care about that too much when we get to heaven. You read about in Revelation what the scene is like in heaven. And in verse 10 of chapter 4, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord. I, I think when we're in God's presence, everything, our whole perspective on things is, is going to be different. And, um, and so it's very hard for us to take our earthly minds and understanding and put them in that realm. Yeah. I think Chris and I are reading from the same book. He said... Uh, yes, we'll recognize one another in heaven. This is evidenced by the rich man and Lazarus and Luke. Abraham was said to have been gathered to his people. David, speaking of his son that passed, said in 2 Samuel 12 that he would go to his son. I think you're exactly right, Chris. And about Kent, he says, yes, I believe so. I do not make an issue out of such with brethren who differ with me on this point. While the scriptures do not address this issue in explicit language, consider the implication of 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. When we consider the context of what is being discussed in this passage, what Paul discussed brings comfort to those who have lost loved ones in death who have been faithful to the Lord. We can thus correctly infer that one aspect of the comfort that Paul discusses is the reality of recognition of those faithful loved ones in heaven. I, I agree, Ken. That's a good argument. I hadn't really thought about that one, but that, I think that's a good one, too. And I, I agree. There, there, this is not an issue that we have to fall out about, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting question. Uh, real quickly, we're just out of time. Kevin in the chat room says... Uh, you already mentioned our best example regarding understanding what we will know after death. The rich man certainly knew Lazarus and judged him worthy that God might release Lazarus to go to the rich man's brothers. The rich man did not assume the same for himself. No, that's a good point, Kevin. In other words, he didn't say, let me go warn my brothers. He said, let Lazarus go warn my brothers because because uh, of, of his state. He knew he wasn't worthy to do that. So the rich man knew Lazarus and his character, even though they were both destined to differing rewards. And D. Roy says heaven will be awesome and probably based upon unimaginable things we probably won't care because we will be breathless, perhaps. I think heaven's going to be different than... You know, we, I think because we're limited in time and space and material reality, 
I think a lot of times we try to impose a, a materialistic view on heaven. It's going to be different than, yeah. than that. Yeah. All right. Good discussion tonight, and uh, hopefully it's been helpful for our listeners uh, and uh, lots of good comments from our listeners, so thanks for those tonight. Kyle, final thoughts from you. Uh, it was good. It's a great discussion, and uh, that's something we all need to think about and hopefully strive towards heaven. So, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for good. being here and helping us get on the air tonight, it Kyle. Was good. And Dad, thanks for your thanks, time. Thanks, Jacob. And, uh, oh, next week. Tell us about next week. Next week, we've got an important discussion. We're going to have a discussion. I don't know that we've ever had a much discussion about this on the program. Self-defense. I don't know that we have either. Self-defense. We're going to talk about whether a Christian can defend himself. Uh, I think maybe in particular whether you can use lethal force yes. to defend yourself. And we're going to have two people on both sides of that issue presenting their case. A person on each side of that issue. Yeah, one person on each side. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Two people total. And well, actually, you and I are just sort of going to moderate right. a little we're mini debate, uh, sort of a, be a little mini debate on, on our program. And we're going to give our listeners time to ask questions of the, each side. Yeah, of yeah. The so make, make a note to be sure to, to listen to the virtual Bible study next Thursday night. Lord willing, we're going to have this little mini debate about the question of can a Christian engage in self-defense, especially lethal self-defense. All right. You'll want to be here for that. So we make, hope you make plans to be back here this time next week for that important discussion. And in the meantime, we encourage you to put God first in your life, study His inspired Word of the Bible, and live by it every day. You'll never regret it. Thanks for listening to the Virtual Bible Study, brought to you by the College View Church of Christ. The College View Church of Christ meets at 1618 Hampshire Pike in Columbia, Tennessee. If you are in the Columbia, Tennessee area, we encourage you to worship with the College View Church of Christ on Sunday mornings at 930 and on Sunday evenings at 6 o'clock. The College View Church of Christ also welcomes you to attend their Wednesday night Bible studies at 7 o'clock. If you have any questions about something that was said on tonight's broadcast or would like more information about the College College View Church of Christ, please call 931-381-4567. That number again, 931-381-4567. Or for more information on the internet, visit collegeview.com. Be sure to tune into the virtual Bible study this time next Thursday for another informative study of God's Word.